Hey people, so a few people have um, have commented on my channel or they've sent me emails asking me if I'm still doing save file magic. And the answer to that question is absolutely 100% yes, I will do more save file magic. So for people who don't know, save file magic is where you guys send me your save files that are absolutely unwinnable and I try to turn the ship around and win the game. And I've had a lot of fun with them. But the reason I haven't done more is that you guys haven't been sending me suitable files. I don't know if this is like some sort of stealth insult or something like that, but you guys are like sending me save files where it's like you're playing on Regent or Monarch and you were kicking ass, but then you had like a minor setback and it's like, oh, Sway, this is going to be a really difficult one. I don't know if you can be able to turn around the ship on this. It's, it's easy. Come on, guys. This is a good save file. Have more confidence in yourself. Have more confidence in your gameplay. This is like, you're doing above average here. Why would you send me this save file? Look at this. 5% world land area. Uh, and plenty of land still to expand. You got some islands. You can make a play for the mainland. It's going great. You're behind by like two techs. It'll be fine. You can even do the Great Library. So yeah, even though I don't think this is by any means unwinnable and it'd be pretty trivial to turn it around or just carry on what you're doing, I guess. Uh, I'm still happy you guys are sending in save files because I, I know you guys just want to see if your save files on there. You want to hear me talk about your save files. And I like looking at other people's save files too. So it's a win-win for everybody. So let's talk about this save file. So yeah, this is going great. They immediately did a quick conquest on the Americans here. It's only turn, what, turn 135? And they've already cleaned up their mini continent. That's fantastic. Uh, I got to say, you should be building more workers. Some of the, like, cities like this, right? You could do a harbor in, what, like, 30 turns? And the harbor does almost nothing for you or you could just build a worker every every 10 turns and the worker will immediately become useful it will start working tiles so to cities like this this all the cities that are too corrupt basically when you reach the point where the city has like one shield per turn upon founding so this one has three because it's not very corrupt uh but something like this yeah there's only one shield per turn despite the fact it has some shields here just because of the corruption so once you reach this kind of city you're going to want to be building workers in it and then you improve the tiles until you have like more food more production and then when you have more production that's when you build the buildings that's when you build the units uh yeah you guys are also like weirdly obsessed with building harbors I, like i guess this city could use a harbor because it only has one two food tile uh but Tokyo, no. Satsuma, definitely not. Just build workers, man. Like, this city is going to be garbage until you get some workers in and you irrigate these plains tiles. So this could have, like, what, like, five or six production per turn minus corruption if you just irrigate all these plains tiles? Uh, because you haven't done that, you just have the harbor, it's not doing anything good in terms of production or growth. You could grow faster with this irrigated, too. Uh, I also, because the sense we're talking about the CFL, I have to mention this thing. Oh, <laughs> so for one, the one city that could actually benefit a ton from having, or benefit somewhat, I, like I would build a harbor in the city is, is Kyoto, because Kyoto would get the extra food on the, the fish. Fish is plus, I'm not crazy, am I? Uh, yeah, even with the despotism penalty, yes, you'd get the extra food from the fish, and when you come out of despotism, you get extra food from this tile and this tile. Uh, so if you have like whales or fish, you, it's actually better you get better yields from a harbor because you're actually using those tiles as a higher priority uh on top of that this is the funniest thing with the save felt look, look at this weird city placement like this is on the, like the tip of the peninsula they only got one bonus grassland here and this was actually something they opted into look at this so they planted their city what was it 3900 bc so, like, I know that they walked two tiles just to get to that really shitty tip of the peninsula start right there. Uh, that or... Wait, I guess the alternative is that they... Uh, they spawned, like, here or here. Or they spawned on the peninsula and they walked here. They probably, like, they could maybe see the... Bon They're like, this doesn't get any better. I'm going back onto that peninsula. <laughs> So yeah, like they would have had a much better start if they just planted their city on the spot here, or maybe walked to the coast here, or planted on the spot. I get four bonus grasslands instead of just one. Like the whale is fine, but yeah. Okay, on to the next save file. Okay, so this save is a little bit worse than the the one before, and it's from the same player. And I get kind of get why they're sending it to me. Like they were trying to do a war against the Incans, they were having uh, mixed results. Uh, again, it's still pretty easy to turn around. Like, you have a nation, you, you're not behind on tech at all, you have good infrastructure. On Regent or Monarch, that's, you, you just play the game normally and, and, and you'll win if you, if you know what you're doing. Uh, you don't need to do any crazy tricks like I like to do in my save file magic. Uh, so yeah, like, 
I think one of the things that I, I generally recommend and you can kind of see from the save is just like focus on what you're doing. Like if you want to do naval expansion, don't just don't half asset and like just get a few far away cities. Try to like put in the work to like actually defend the cities uh, and get as many as you can. Uh, and if you're doing conquest, then, then go for conquest. If you're doing like wonders and focusing on commerce, then first of all, don't play monarchy and, and, and focus on that. So for example, here, they're like 400 shields, 450 shields into Sun Tzu's Art of War. Look what Sun Tzu's Art of War does for them here. On their, this continent, they have two, literally count them, one, two cities that don't have barracks. A barracks for a militaristic civ costs 10 shields. They're paying, or 20 shields, sorry. They're paying 600 shields for something that nets them 40 shields worth of output. Obviously, the maintenance is reduced, and they'll get more cities, hopefully, in the future. But if they literally gave up on this game because, like, oh, our war is not going well, then then just don't build the wonder. Just focus here. You could just build a bunch of medieval infantry in 10. Like, if you had built, what is a medieval infantry, 10 shields or 40 shields, sorry. If you'd spent 450 shields building 11 medieval infantry and you walked them in a stack, I guarantee you could take, like, three cities combined with what you have. You could take three cities off the Incans and you'd be in much better shape. Uh, so, yeah, don't overfocus focus wonders. Uh, this is a tangent that uh, I guess it brings me to another save file. But uh, generally, I, I was worried when I released the, the wonder tier list, both uh, especially the updated one where I put more emphasis on the, the tourism gold wonders that don't have really an immediate impact if you don't stack a bunch of them on top of each other. Uh, that players, like, people talk about wonder addiction. It's not so much addiction. It's just over-focusing them and under-focusing their expansion phase, kind of just half-assing the other aspects of the gameplay, like they don't build enough workers, they go for attacks, but they don't build enough units, and they don't do a proper expansion phase, and they don't scout. Uh, so if you're letting all those things slide to the, way slide to the wayside, like like here, they went for Colossus. I actually kind of, it's kind of fine here that they went for Colossus because they at least irrigated a bunch and made a point of getting their city to a high population. Because the Colossus doesn't do much if you're at a low population. But look what happened to their expansion phase. I'll, I'll retire to the game for you. Like, I know that the Incans here have, like, they're an agricultural sieve that has a river and they got a two cow cap, so it's not exactly a fair fight. But, but look at this. So because they went for the early wonder of the Colossus, they fell massively behind in in terms of expansion. Yeah, and, and so the the battle against the Incans is just going to be such an uphill battle from here because they've massively outexpanded you. Uh, it's better to either focus on settlers early or focus on fighting early. And if you're like in a position like this where you got like a you're competing for city spots on an island, then like get the core city spots first and then do the wonders. If you can't get the wonders without messing up some core city spot, like without losing some core city spots. It's probably not worth getting the oracle. It's probably not worth getting. It's never worth getting the oracle, but it's not worth getting the Colossus and all those other uh, early game wonders. Get the core cities first. So this is another example of what I just talked about. I'm actually extremely proud of this player. They sent me a few save files from this game. I'm extremely proud of them for turning this around. Look at how awful this land, like they didn't even realize how awful the land is, but like look at how many mountains, how many hills, and how little food are in their two core cities. Uh, and they went for early wonders. They went for, I think one of these was from a, uh, free from a great scientist, but like look how badly they got ex out expanded here. Like I think part of the issue is that people have these bad habits left over from playing on Chieftain and Warlord that they think they can just kind of not really take their expansion phase seriously, or at least not, or to at least take it very slowly. And then they end up in this massive uphill battle. And they don't really understand that the uphill battle was something that they've put onto themselves. Uh, something they can just opt out of by focusing on settlers early. You don't just inherently, like, you don't inherently on Monarch or on Regent have to fight with, like, three cities against nine cities of the AI. So, yeah, like, at this point, the Incans have what? I think they're going to get one more. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. He's on two cities. Uh, again, so really think whether wonders are something you want to focus on, and whether you're what what else you're giving up in exchange for building those wonders, and what those wonders actually do for you. Like in the case of the Sun Tzu's Art of War, uh, if they'd like had been going for Great Lighthouse, Great Lighthouse is a fantastic wonder. Great Library is always a fantastic wonder. You can toss away expansions; like it's it's worth giving up a few city spots for a, a secure build on the Great Library. But things like a lot of wonders just aren't really worth it because they don't do anything for you immediately, whereas having a bunch of cities does stuff for you immediately.
So this one's a demigod save, uh, and demigod are a little, like, if you put yourself in a bad position, it's a little bit harder for me to, to fix the game, especially if you wait a long time. Uh, this one, they're in quite a good position, and so I, I don't think this is worth doing an entire video on, but I, I kind of wanted to show you this one funny thing that, look, look at this, this is actually, like, I think they're playing 80% water Pangea or something like that, because um, they're actually matching and a head in population, matching world air, land area and a head in population. So they're in a really good spot. The issue is they're, they're just an era behind, like they just have feudalism and the other civs just hit the industrial era. So I've got a funny strat for, for kind of fixing this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna embassy Babylon. We're gonna look into Carthage itself because Carthage has the great library. So they have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then one medieval infantry. And they're all regular units, so I think we can actually take this out. So let's do that. So in this case, we're actually gonna really kind of throw, like we're gonna. So we're gonna do something called rite of passage abuse. Oh my god, what did I do? Oh my god, no, that wasn't what I was supposed to do. <laughs> so we're gonna do rite of passage abuse. What that means is you you get a rite of passage and you use that to really screw over the AI. And I don't normally like doing this. Oh my god, he doesn't have engineering. Uh, because, first of all, having a good trade rep is very important. It really screws you if you don't have that. Uh, but second of all, uh, it's just kind of cheap. Uh, but in this case, at least the, the first point is not really relevant to the issue. Uh, so yeah, well, we're going to look inside Carthage again. Same stuff, and get the embassy with Babylon, and we get rite of passages with both these civs. Okay, so rite of passage, done. Uh, Babylon, oops, rite of passage. Uh, weirdly, fun fact, they actually value rite of passage based on how much land area you control. So because we have the most land area in the game, the, the other civs will always do rite of passages with us, because they think, oh, we get access to a lot of territory by having this agreement. Okay, I'll throw a uh, Jaguar Warrior in there. Great. Okay, people, our stack is now in position. Let's go for it. So we're going to attack with the army last, because I think the army is going to be effective at like finishing off low health units. Um, and the one advantage we have is that our units will retreat. So we can do like a couple of points of damage, and then we run away. I mean, likely one point of damage, or we don't get the retreat. Uh, yeah. Just keep on trying. And yeah, they shouldn't promote too much just because of this, uh, because of the retreat, which is really helpful. Like if they were a veteran, it wouldn't be such a huge factor, but because they're, uh... ooh, I think we can go with this now. Oh, nice, okay. This one's already veteran, so we can use the, the weaker units. Ah, come on. Okay, oh nice, I finished this guy off, do it again. Again, we don't want to lose because then they pretty likely to promote, that'd be the second victory for that unit, I think. Okay, nice, uh, we, we got the wonder. So this has a great light library, so let's see what the great library does. We could just give up all our, like this doesn't matter at this point, because what the great library is going to do, it can actually give you text past education. Um, as long as those techs are already owned by all the other civs once you get the Great Library. So normally you have to capture it for that effect to take place. I guess it's possible you could build it really, really late if the AI is really lazy at getting literature. So yeah, the Great Library's library has gone obsolete, but we're still getting techs. Uh, banking, which requires education. We get astronomy. We get all the way up to the start of the industrial era. Great. So at this point, you're playing on Demigod. You control a quarter of the world and you have parity in terms of tech. Uh, and you can probably clean up this. You might want to get the Babylonians at war with the Carthaginians too, and then it's just gonna be a 1v1 on this continent. Okay, I got one last safe file to talk about. I wanted to talk about this one because I got a, I had a lot of th positive things to say about it. Let's just uh, check the difficulty. You can load the game and I'll show you the, the difficulty. Uh, I like how all their, most of their tall, yeah, it's Monarch. Most of their tall improvements were, were already done at this point. Uh, like they got roads absolutely everywhere. This is a bit excessive. Uh, for one, you actually want to do um, plant forest 
uh, it gives you two shields instead of just one. Although mine plus railroad also gives you two shields, so at this point you'd probably want the railroad because it's it's faster than planting the forest, and you probably want a railroad anyway. Uh, the one big criticism I have to make here is that these cities are way too far apart. Like, there's a bunch of wasted tiles in between all these cities. So, for example, you don't need to be working this tile because, oh, I guess this, <laughs> sorry, that's a bad example. This bonus grassland, for example. So, no city can ever use that bonus grassland because it's not within... These are the usable tiles, the Big Fat Cross. This is outside of the Big Fat Cross of all the cities in your empire. So you're not actually getting anything out of it. So, uh, and this is like a tile that's very close to your capital. So it's worth a lot because it's minimal distance corruption for that tile. So yeah, you'd want to put your cities much, much closer together. Make sure that it, it's okay for the cities to overlap. Uh, for like the, there to be, yeah, like these cities, they can't use the same hill. They, the the hill is within range of both cities, but Houston's fine. It can use other tiles. It's okay for the bear to be overlap. I like to play so that each city has about 12 to 14 tiles, but some people like playing a little bit looser. That's okay, as long as you don't waste a ton of... Oh my god, this deer is painful. And the coal, too. There's extra shields, and like you get bonus shields on the coal. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, so the nice things I have to say, uh, I like how they did the, the luxuries. They're actually very good at trading for luxuries this game. That's very, very well played. Uh, I believe they did Sistine Chapel. Uh, where's the Sistine Chapel for them? Yes, yeah, to Sistine Chapel in Boston, which was a good choice because you'll notice that they actually can't trade with the other civs, or, or they couldn't trade with the other civs until they, uh, they hit navigation or magnetism. These texts allow you to trade over ocean tiles, and because there's no linkage of like sea tiles to the, the other continents, or coast tiles, hopefully, uh, they can't actually trade navally until they get those techs. So until that time, they can't really get any luxuries aside from, uh, they actually spawn with no luxuries here. So yeah, so doing Sistine Chapel plus Cathedrals is a, a really good strat here for getting luxuries, because or for getting happiness, because you can't trade for luxuries in this specific circumstance. Uh, so I like that quite a bit. Uh, and yeah, they, they just generally, they got control of their continent. Uh, and let's see, is there a courthouse in the capital? Oh, there's a court, okay. <laughs> okay, I take back everything I said. This is an awful save. <laughs> I'll say that this save file actually does uh, fall into one of the traps that I've talked about in a previous video on uh, intermediate tips, I believe, or beginner tips, where they're playing on an oversized map, and this is making them run into issues. So we'll retire the game here. What do you reasonably expect the Americans to do in this position to deal with the Chinese? Because the Chinese are going to have, like, three times more land than... Okay, maybe twice as much land as the Americans will have access to. Plus, they can trade with the other civs immediately. Plus, they have access to more luxury resources immediately. So they got all these advantages. They're just going to be, like, by the time the Americans actually contact these civs, they're going to be, the Chinese have actually conquered the, the Japanese or the Aztecs or whoever this is. Uh, and so they're actually three times as big as the Americans. So you're facing this massive uphill battle because the spawn distributions are uneven on this map. And so as a result, you have to like face these massive runaway AI sieves. So this is one of the reasons why I don't like playing on oversized maps. Now, if this was me, like if I was playing from the start, I'd know how to handle this. Uh, I'd like send a ton of suicide galleys until I made contact. And I can maybe ma manipulate things diplomatically to like, like gang up all these three sieves on China to make sure China doesn't run away with the game. But that's like really, you have to really know what you're doing for that. It's much simpler just to like play a map with the recommended number of sieves, and you're not going to have to run into these ridiculous issues that you, you get on these oversized maps. Yeah, so I guess the last thing I wanted to say about the save file was I was really happy that they went Republic in this case. So the Commerce bonus from Republic is absolutely insane. I've talked about this a lot. And because they're alone on this island that's not linked by coast tiles, it's not even linked by sea tiles. So the AI can't even touch them until they get to either navigation or magnetism. So for half the game, you're completely untouchable here. You would be trolling to play any other government that's not Republic because the commerce bonus from Republic is so good and there's no downside because the AI can't attack you. So yeah, uh, I was happy with the save file, but I'm also happy with all the, like I, I like looking at like the, the quirks and ex eccentricities of, of how you guys play. So definitely send me your save files and I'll do more reviews like this. And if you can especially send me save files where you've just like completely blown it, you're completely screwed, there's absolutely no way you can turn it around, send it to me, I'll see if I can turn it around. That'd be a lot of fun. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time.